Well, praise the Lord. The Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the world. I'm going to be uh, showing you something tonight that's really rather interesting regarding the Lamb of God. Uh, we're going to dismiss our children to Children's Church at this time. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Thank you. The Mayans were wrong. I told you. I could have told you. I did tell you. I'm sorry they were wrong, to be honest with you. I was, you know, would have been nice to get out of here, but uh, until the Lord says it's time... We are going to do as he's told us to do. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 2. Obviously, it is the Christmas story. Luke, chapter 2. And when you get there, please stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word. Luke, chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 1. Luke, chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them uh, into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word and your word alone, Lord God, is eternal truth. Your word and your word alone, O oh God, is what we stand upon, what we live by. I pray today, Lord, that this word, this message... God would go forth with power and authority. And I pray, Lord, that it would find its place in the hearts of your people. I ask, God, that Jesus Christ would be exalted. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would understand the reason for the season. I pray, Father, that you will guide us and direct us in the remainder of this service. And we ask it for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated, please. The title of my message this morning, Bread of Life, Bread of Life. From the very beginning of mankind, the world has been looking for a Savior. If you go back with me to Genesis chapter 3 with the, with the fall of man, you know the story. God said, don't, 
Don't eat of this tree. Don't. And they did. And because of their disobedience, sin came into the world and sin separated and they were taken out of the garden, separated from God and from his presence. And, uh, and they were lost. Sin, sickness, death, pain, sorrow came into the world as a result of man's sin. God said to the first couple in Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between, uh, uh, between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, God was speaking to Satan of, of the promise of the Messiah, the promise of the Savior. God was telling uh, the devil, he was telling uh, Adam and Eve, that there would be a Savior that would come. He would come and he would reverse the effects of sin. Shortly after that, outside of the garden, Eve gives birth to Cain. In chapter 4, verse 1, and, 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 and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. In the Hebrew and in the context what Eve believed when she said, I have gotten me a man from the Lord. What she was saying in essence is, I have gotten the man from the Lord. See, Cain, uh, uh, Eve believed that she had given birth to the Redeemer. She believed that she had been given the man that God had said would come that would reverse sin. She believed Cain was in fact the Redeemer. And from that point on, mankind has been looking for a Savior. Mankind has been looking for a deliverer, for the one that God would send that would reverse the effects of sin and restore mankind to fellowship with the Lord. Listen, listen to the prophets down through the ages. Isaiah in chapter 9, the prophet Isaiah spoke of his birth. In Isaiah 7, he spoke of his virgin birth. Daniel 9, Daniel the prophet spoke of the time of his birth. Micah 5, the place of his birth. Numbers 24, the Bible speaks of the appearance of the star. We're told of his star would appear. Isaiah 11 speaks of uh, him being from the family of Jesse. Jeremiah 23, from the house of David. Psalm 72 says that he would be worshipped by kings. He would be worshipped by shepherds. Hosea 11 speaks of his flight in Egypt. Remember when Herod sought to destroy the lives of all children two years and younger and the family took flight to Egypt? Hosea told us of that in chapter 11. Jeremiah 31 spoke of the weeping, Rachel's weeping over the babies that Herod would slay. Friends, we have the prophets down through the ages telling us the time, the place, the person, the circumstances surrounding his birth. And it all came to fruition in Bethlehem. His death, his birth was accurately foretold, 100%. His death was just as accurately foretold. But since we're speaking of his birth today, and, and not, uh, not necessarily the prophecies concerning his death, I, I won't go into them, but just as the prophets were 100% accurate in, in foretelling his birth, so they were in foretelling his death and his resurrection. So I ask you this morning, Mayans? <laughs> Somebody once said if the Mayans were so good at predicting the, the, you know, the future, why are there no more Mayans today, you know? Couldn't they accurately predict, you know, that? I'm, you know, I'm sorry that the Mayans were wrong, but I could have told you. In fact, I did. <laughs> no man knoweth the day nor the hour, but God alone. But I, I ask you this, friends. If, if the prophets were 100% accurate in, in predicting his his first coming, and 100% accurate in predicting his death and his resurrection. Friends, should there be any reason for a thinking person to doubt the 100% accurate fulfillment of the Bible's prediction of his second coming? Maybe there's a lot of words in there. Shouldn't we be looking for his second coming? And have the same assurance that it will be 100% accurate. 
Friends, it's a matter of timing. It is all a matter of timing. You see, there could have been no other time when the Messiah was born. There could have been none. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 11 what happened? Genesis chapter 11, uh, God had said after the flood, go and multiply and replenish the earth. And, and, and the, you know, the descendants of Noah said, no, uh, we're not going to. We're, we're going to establish our own uh, country, our own nation. We're going we're gonna to protect ourselves. We're going to build a tower to reach unto, unto heaven. We're not going to obey you, God. We're going to do our own thing. And what did God do? The Bible says that God came down and said, uh, uh, not on your life, and scrambled their languages. The Tower of Babel, we call it babbling. Hopefully I won't do that this morning. And, and they began, and the world's languages were confused. So that people, even in their own households, could not communicate any longer. And so people formed nations of, their, of those languages, and they were forced to spread across the world. But, but communication was, was, so, was sorely hindered. They couldn't communicate one with another. Do you understand? Language was, was, con, was confused. It was impossible for communication. And so it would have been impossible for the gospel to have spread. Jesus couldn't have been born then. There could have been no gospel message because the word couldn't have gotten out. Nobody could have communicated the gospel message. But due to the conquest of the Roman Empire and their Hellenistic influence, that's the Greek-speaking influence, the whole known world was now speaking Greek, speaking one language. Are you with me? At this time in history, when the Roman Empire now had control of the known world and they were teaching this one language, the world, as it were, was now speaking one language again, if not first language, at least second language, and so they were now speaking one language, Greek. And it was then that Jesus was born. We know that the Bible tells us that the taxes needed to be collected at this time. And so all those, a census was being taken by, by law. And so by law, every family needed to go back to the city of their origin, back to their birthplace or back to their family's birthplace. And we know this because the scripture tells us in the text that I read that Joseph and Mary had to return to the city of their origin to Bethlehem. You still there? Amen. Now just so you understand this, when, when we look at this, we know, we know that, uh, that Joseph was not the father of Jesus. We know that God is the father of Jesus. And Joseph had to return because he was of the household of David. He needed to return to Bethlehem. But do you know this? Do you know that Mary was also of the household of David? And so if you, tra if you trace the lineage of Christ in either way, father or mother, they both needed to return to Bethlehem for this census and for the taxes to be taken. And so Joseph and Mary both returned to Bethlehem. The point I'm trying to make here, friends, is the whole world's history. The whole history of the world was leading to this one place at this one time. Time. Everything was pointing to Bethlehem on this night in, in this place. All of the prophets spoke of this night. All of the nations, friends, yielded in conquest to Rome for the sake of language for this night. This couple, Joseph and Mary, brought to this place on this night all in God's perfect plan and timing. Do you get it? Everything culminating, all that the prophets have said, all that was ever said and spoken, all coming down, the world being formed and fashioned, pointing to this one place, this one time where Jesus would be born. And, and Paul speaks and he says it more concisely in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. He says, but when the fullness of time was come, there was no other time. 
Jesus could not have been born in any other time in history. It never would have fulfilled the prophet's uh, predictions. It, w- it wouldn't have been uh, communicated. There, it was in the fullness of time, in God's perfect timing, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. In God's perfect plan and timing, culminating in this event, on this night, in this place. Friends, what I'm trying to say is there are absolutely no accidents with God. There are no accidents with God. His timing and His plan is perfect. Even if we don't understand when things happen and we don't understand how they affect us and how, how we're caught up in things, in God's perfect timing and in God's perfect plan, all things are unfolding. And on this night, in this place, according to God's perfect plan, the Messiah was born. It wasn't a gospel of riches. I don't know what you're expecting. I hear teachers... Well, I don't hear them because I turn them off, but on TV and (laughs) teachers uh, professing a gospel of riches, you know, claiming things and and having whatever you want and and God's blessings just were, were, look at this woman. This is the mother of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, and and she's a pauper. She's not, she's not rich. She came riding into Bethlehem on a donkey, not on uh, gold-plated chariots. No entourage of royalty. She came, a pauper, a poor girl, uh, espoused to a poor man. And this baby was born in a stable. Now, we romanticize Christmas. We clean it up. First of all, when you see Mary, this young, attractive young woman, um, you know, in beautiful, clean attire and makeup. (laughs) And she just looks so lovely. She just gave birth. (laughs) You, You understand what I'm saying? We romanticize it. We clean it up a lot. It's a stable. This stable, it's a barn. Carved more than likely out of the limestone in a hill where they kept the service animals. It's a barn. You ever been in a barn with all the smells and the sights and the sounds? This is where Jesus was born, in a barn, in a smelly old barn. And his bed was a feeding trough, a hay trough for animals. That's where he was laid. See, this isn't the, this isn't the Bethlehem Hilton. This isn't first class. This isn't what you would expect for a king. But you see, there was no room in the inn. There was no room in the, in the motel. There was no room for him. Now, I understand. But do you not find this a bit odd? Do you not find this a bit odd that, that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Messiah, the Son of Almighty God, would be born and, and laid in a manger, in a hay trough, in a smelly old barn, uh, because there was no room for him? Do you not find this a bit odd? Now I understand, Bethlehem, it's a small town. And I understand that because of the decree, because of the census, there were people coming uh, from all over the known world to this little town that they might respond to the census and pay their taxes. And I understand that little Bethlehem was overwhelmed with people, with travelers. And, and so some must have gotten there first and, and so there were no rooms. I, I, I understand that. I comprehend. This wasn't a large hotel. There was no large hotel in Bethlehem. This tiny little village. There, this was a tr- the inn that they speak of was a traveler's hostel. Have you, ever, have you ever slept in a hostel, a youth hostel? It's just a bed and a, and a, and a shower in modern days. Then I, it, it was probably just a, an empty room, an open room, and just find a corner and you know, 
Find a square and sleep on it. That's all that the Bethlehem Inn was. There's, there's nothing, there's no, you know, and I'm sure it was overwhelmed with travelers. But what I find odd is this. The prophets had been, had been speaking of the coming of the Messiah. The prophets. God himself told uh, Adam and Eve in, in, in Genesis that, that there would be one who would be born to reverse the uh, sin's effect. And, and, we, and Michael told us where, and Daniel told us when, and all the prophets told us of the lineage, the time, the place, the circumstances surrounding him. Wouldn't they have been looking for him? Shouldn't they have been anxious for the Redeemer to come? Shouldn't they have been anxious for the Messiah to come? And here's this young lady of the lineage of the house of, of David, uh, 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 the, the family of Jesse. What, wouldn't, and on all the, wouldn't you have been looking? Shouldn't they have been looking if they knew where and when and, and who? Would the people not be watching? And friends, even as Jesus matured, even as he grew, and even as he began to minister, and even as he began to preach and do miracles, still they missed it. Still they rejected him. Still they would not accept him as the Messiah. Listen, he came, friends, in, in the incarnation. A big word, incarnation, it simply means that God came in the flesh. He was born in the flesh. Not half man, half God, but holy man and holy God. Don't ask me to explain the incarnation. Don't ask me to explain creation. Don't ask me to explain time or space. Don't ask me. I, I can't, but I accept them because the Bible tells me. And I, and I read that this is God in the flesh. He came that he might identify with us, that he might walk in our shoes, that he might live our lives, that he might understand our pain and our sorrow and our grief and our loneliness, and that he might then pay for our sin, taking our punishment to the cross. This is the incarnation. This is, this is, this is what it means. Listen, Philippians, Paul says in chapter 2 of Philippians, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That means that he emptied himself to be born as a man and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the Christmas story. This is the Christmas message. That God came in the form of man that he might identify with us, that he might connect with us, and that he might die. That's the Christmas story. We romanticize it with a, a sweet little angelic baby in a manger, and, and we, we romanticize it with a beautiful nativity scene. But this is the gospel message. This is the story of Christmas, that Jesus came to die, and to die on the cross, a horrible a horrible death. See, friends, there is, Christmas makes absolutely no sense if there is not a Good Friday and if there is not a Resurrection Sunday. G Jesus came. This is Christmas. He came to die for us. So how many times do you hear, and maybe you've said it yourself. Still with me? Amen. How many times have you heard, and maybe you've said it yourself, it just doesn't feel like Christmas. It just doesn't feel like Christmas. It's just, you know, when I was a little child, remember as a child what Christmas was like? I mean, it was so exciting. It was like, you know, you were, you were, it was adrenaline for, a, you know, a whole month. You were, Christmas was just so exciting. Now we get older, we grow, and we say, it just, it just doesn't feel 
It doesn't feel like Christmas. What are, what are we saying and why? Because he's not welcome. I submit to you, it's because he's not welcome. If he is at all welcome, he, he's only welcome as a baby laying in a hay trough. He's not welcome, friends, as the, as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He came as king to conquer the hearts of men. You want a picture of Jesus? Revelation chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. John, the revelator on the island of Patmos, he sees the Lord. His head and his hairs were light, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. As he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Friends, we would do a whole lot better to picture this Jesus on Christmas morning than to picture a baby laying in a manger. Listen to me. When we pray in the name of Jesus, we have a whole lot more power than the church realizes. When we pray in the name of Jesus, we're not praying necessarily in the name of this baby laying in the manger, although that is true. But we're praying in the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The one who came to conquer sin and death. Amen. And over all the power of the enemy. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. This is the one that John saw. He didn't see a baby in the manger. He saw the king of kings and the lord of lords. Uh, hair like wool, eyes like fire. Voiceless, the sound of many waters. Uh, this is the one that, that, uh, that John saw. This is the Jesus that Daniel saw. When he saw the... King. This is the, hey, you with me? Amen. This is the Jesus the devil sees when we say in the name of Jesus. Although he trembled at the birth of the Savior, he certainly trembled when he sees the one with white hair and eyes of fire that says, I am that I am the Alpha and the Omega. The devil, when we pray in Jesus' name, that's the one that the, the devil sees and trembles. And this is the one we need to see when we pray. We need to see him through the eyes of faith. A holy, victorious king. How could they have missed it? Had they, I've heard someone said, had they only known what we know now. I mean, they had the prophets, we have the fulfillment we have the history. We have even secular historians recording the birth of Jesus, the carpenter's son. And so they say, well, if they had only known what we know now, they would have certainly opened up uh, the inn at Bethlehem. They certainly would have made room for him. He's the king after all. If they had only known what we know, they would have made room for him in Bethlehem. How much room have we made for him? How much room have we made for Jesus? This generation that we live in has rejected him, knowing who he is. And we've rejected him as a, as a generation. And there's still no room for Jesus in the inn. And so the world wonders why there's so much evil. When we see headlines and we hear reports and destruction happens... If God is a God of love, how could he allow this to happen? If God is a God of love, if God is truly in control, then why didn't he stop the shooter in Newtown? If God is a God of love, if he's truly in control, why didn't he stop the planes from hitting the world trade? If God is truly a God of love, if what you say is true, then why is there so much evil? Why is there so much heartache? Why is there so much grief in the world? We wonder why he, the Prince of Peace, is rejected. He came, friends, to bring peace on earth, goodwill towards men. What happens where, where he is not received? Just look around. Just look at the world. What happens when the king, when there's no room? When he is not received, entire nations are in turmoil. 
Look at the nations where Jesus is not allowed. They are in, in, in turmoil. They're, they're killing each other. They're bombing each other. They're blowing each other up. In nations where Jesus is not allowed. It's nation against nation, brother against brother. It's total chaos. Entire nations, uh, portions of the world in total chaos because Jesus is not welcome. Families, entire families are in distress where Jesus is rejected. Families that are, that are at each other's throats. Families that are being ripped apart because Jesus does not sit on the throne in that family. He's not Lord of that household. They have not made room. And lives are completely out of control where Jesus is rejected. Someone who has not accepted Christ and will not allow him to reign in their hearts. Their lives are completely out of control where Jesus is rejected. How could this happen? The Bible tells us that man's hearts are desperately wicked and only Jesus can change a heart. I said only Jesus can change a heart. Amen. But he's not allowed. There's, there's no room. There's no room. How could a loving God allow such bad things? Can I go back to what I started with? God said, don't. And we did. And we did. And we did. And we do, and we continue to do. God said, don't. And we did, continually, repeatedly, on and on and on. And we still do. It's pretty simple, if you think about it. We have totally disobeyed and rejected God's law and authority. And then we want to know why things are so far out of control. Listen, we have taken ourselves out of his control. Not that God is not in control. I'm almost done. Give me a couple more minutes. Not that God is not in control. Make no mistake about it, friends. There is not one second that God is not in absolute control of his universe. He's got the whole world in his hands. He told us these things would happen. He knew in advance. And he told us how to avoid them, and we refused. God is in complete and absolute control. There, his will, he is sovereign over his universe. And all things are unfolding just as he said they would. God is in absolute control. But what I mean is this, we've taken ourselves out from underneath his grace. Out from underneath his law. We are walking in disobedience to him. And so we, things are out of control because they're not under his divine plan. Do you follow me? In that respect, we've taken ourselves out from underneath what God has told us to do. Does that make sense to you? He's still in absolute control, but, but our lives are, 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 are doing other than what he has told us to do. If that makes sense to you. If not, sorry, it's all I got. <laughs> but when things go wrong, we blame him. We, I, uh, do not. Do. Don't. Do this. Don't do that. And we've done exactly contrary to what he said. And then we want to know, God, why? We blame him when things are out of control. He's given us his law and we broke it. And so what Christmas is, God sent his son. He sent his son. Jesus came to reverse the effects of sin. You're separated from the Father. I will come and I will restore you to the Father. I will be obedient on your behalf. And in me, God will accept you. And so Jesus came to reverse the effects of sin. John 1.12 But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Can I say that again? To those who received Jesus. To those who had room. Who made room. To those who welcomed him and said, Lord, please come into my life. Come into my home. Come into my family. To them he gave power to become sons and daughters of God. To those who believe, who follow in obedience his name. And so we come to the end of this message. In the fullness of time, in the perfection of God's timing, of God's eternal plan, 
He moved the nations. He caused or allowed the Roman Empire to conquer nations, bringing their languages all into one, into Greek, that, that the gospel might travel. He brought all of the nations under this Roman Empire that the taxes might be collected. He, he moved Mary and Joseph at this time to, to go to that little town of Bethlehem to give birth to, to Jesus in that time, in that place, in God's eternal plan. It was a dark night for Bethlehem. I say a dark night. The light of life had come. The light of the world had come, was born in Bethlehem, and there was no room. They rejected him. Bethlehem, or Bethlehem, which the, the, the name means house of bread. Bethlehem, the house of bread. And so the bread of life came to the house of bread, and they rejected him. And he was relegated to a smelly old barn out back. Where is he in your life? Where is Jesus on this Christmas season? Where is Jesus in your life? Is he, has he been relegated to a subservient place in the stables of your life? Is he Lord of your life? Is he... Is he the king of kings? Is he the holy, victorious king in your life? Or is he relegated someplace because there's no room for him? Is there room in your heart for Jesus today? Is there room in your life for Jesus? And will you give up your will for his? Father, I thank you. I thank you today, Lord, for the Son of God. I thank you today for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I thank you for the baby in the manger. I thank you, Lord, for the incarnation, for Emmanuel, God with us. I thank you, Lord, that you humbled yourself, emptied yourself to come down in the, into the form of a man and to live, Lord, as a pauper in a world that rejected you, in an evil, harsh world. You came and you lived perfect and sinless. And I thank you, Lord, that you grew and you taught and you, and you preached and you, and you conquered. And I, I thank you, Lord, that you died on the cross. That you came that you might die to take away my sins and the sins of all the world. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. And I thank you that you rose again, Lord God. Jesus, you rose from the grave. And now, Lord, we have the promise of eternal life. You, the firstfruits, have made a way for us to be restored to the Father and to live everlasting life with you. God, I am so grateful today for this Christmas story. I thank you for those that have accepted you, that have acknowledged and made room for Jesus, who have surrendered their own wills for your will, who have said, yes, Lord, please uh, take lordship of my life, take control of my life. I willingly submit and surrender. I, for those who have made room for Jesus, I am so grateful. Father, I pray today for those, maybe even some bowed in this auditorium this morning. Perhaps maybe they have not opened up their hearts to you. Perhaps, God, they have not surrendered their will. They have not acknowledged what Christmas truly means. They've not asked forgiveness for their sin. And they've not invited you to be Lord of their lives and Savior of their souls. Lord, I pray this morning that, that this message has struck a chord, that it has found its place. I pray, Lord, that every, that every person would hear this and receive this. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, let me just ask you this in the final moment of this service. You're here this morning not by accident, but by divine plan. You're here. This message you heard this morning is by divine plan from the foundation of the world. God is speaking to your heart. Maybe you've not asked the Lord Jesus into your heart this morning. 
and that you hear this message and you hear God speaking to you and you would say today, Pastor, I, I want to surrender my sin to God. I want, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I want my sins forgiven. I, 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 want to, I want to know what it means for Him to be Lord of my life. Would you just raise your hand and let me pray with you? If that's you this morning, I, I just, I, I, want, I want to make room for Jesus. I have not made room for Him in the past, but I, I want to make room for Him this morning. Child of God, I ask you, yes. I ask you this morning, if, you've, if your life has been cluttered to the point where Jesus is he's taken a back seat, he's, he's pushed into some other uh, subservient place in your life, I, I ask you today to make room. On this Christmas season, would you make room for Jesus? Would you, would you give him your life? Would you recommit your life to him and say, Lord, be, be Lord of all my life. And in this coming year, Lord, I surrender all to you. Be glorified in my life, I pray. Father, I pray for those that are bowed in your presence today. And I, and I ask, God, that, that, this, that this Christmas, this Christmas, Lord, we would have a, a full and, uh, understanding of the Messiah, of the King. That we would make room for you, Lord God, and that you would be glorified in all that we say and do. I pray, Lord, that as we gather around the tables this Christmas day, Lord, that you would give us opportunity to share this message with our friends and with our families. And that they too would make room for Jesus. I pray, God, that you would be glorified in each of our lives. And this will be for all of us the very merriest of Christmas. I pray, God, that you bless us now as we go. Be glorified, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Merry Christmas, my friends. Merry Christmas.